So what I'll do uh, is just quickly give you an oversight of what the uh, support framework uh, will be as we're moving forward and then uh, look at the, some of the impacts uh, that we, we expect to see within the, the beef sector. So first of all, looking at the uh, framework that uh, has been uh, decided upon for uh, Northern Ireland, uh, we had quite a bit of choice in terms of what we could have used, uh, but we've kept it as simple uh, as, as we possibly could. Uh, so we are just implement, imp implementing the three compulsory elements, the basic payment, the greening payment, and the young farmers uh, uh, top-up payment. So 70% will be devoted towards that uh, basic payment scheme, 30% on greening, and then a 2% budget set aside uh, for uh, that young farmer support. So uh, a lot simpler than it uh, could have been, a lot simpler than has been deployed in some other regions, uh, and that, that's the basis on which we'll move forward. In terms of the basic uh, payment scheme itself, uh, the passport into the new regime will be have you claimed support sing single farm payments in 2013. That's, uh, that's a, an entry requirement and a, and a minimum uh, three hectare claim size to start you off. All existing uh, entitlements from the single farm payment will be cancelled at the end of this year um, and new entitlements under the basic payment scheme will be allocated in 2015. This is an important opportunity for producers to establish a new support framework or a platform for, for their individual business, uh, businesses. This is an opportunity to amend decisions taken back uh, in 2005. Back then, many producers decided to, to stack their entitlements on owned land. This is an opportunity to unwind that position, to re-establish a platform that reflects your current farming enterprises, uh, and, that, and that's an important opportunity. So the starting point then uh, from 2015 will be what value will your entitlements be. So you will carry forward your single farm payment entitlements to the value of that pot held on the 15th of May uh, 2014. And that will be suitably adjusted to obviously set aside budget for greening, etc. And the residual amount will be used to calculate the value of your new basic payment scheme entitlements. So it'll be spread across the area of land that you declare uh, in 2015. You must declare all your eligible land. And that will be your initial uh, basic payment uh, scheme entitlements. And then over a period of uh, seven years, you will, you will move from that initial starting point towards a flat rate regime. Um, and the first step of that progression of those seven steps will occur in 2015. And of course, we'll operate uh, as a single region uh, in Northern Ireland. So, a relatively simple model um, that we'll be adopting. Second compulsory component, the green payment. It's completely inseparable, indivisible from the basic payment scheme. If you pay the basic payment uh, or you claim the basic payment, then you must also abide by the greening obligations uh, and you will receive the greening payment as well. 30% of the budget will be allocated towards that. In terms of what that will mean for individual businesses, decision was taken uh, that it will be allocated on the basis of the value of the individual entitlements that you hold. So if you start off with high value entitlements, you'll get a high greening payment per hectare. If you have low value entitlements, it will be a low greening uh, payment per hectare, but it will all converge towards a flat rate at the same pace of progression as the, the basic payment entitlement. So over seven years, it will move to a flat rate payment per hectare. Greening requirements will be assessed on all eligible land on your holding, um, but payment will be only on that land where you claim the basic payment. Now that doesn't really matter in 2015, you'll be declaring all your land and you'll be allocated entitlements in all of your land. But in future years, if you take in rent in additional land, you may not have entitlements for it, but you still will have the greening obligations on all of your holding. Three requirements covering permanent grassland, crop diversification, ecological focus area. Now, for grassland farmers, if that's all you have, you will not be required to make any adjustment to your farm businesses. If you do have arable land, then you'll need to acquaint yourself with the potential requirements under crop diversification and ecological focus area. And this is where a lot of the complications will arise. We believe at this stage, uh, across North Ireland, around about 1,500 farmers will be affected by these obligations. But for grassland farmers, uh, there will be no, no requirement for any, any change. Then the third component, the Young Farmers Scheme. Uh, obviously quite a lot of interest uh, in this uh, at this point in time. So 2% of the direct payment ceiling has been set aside for uh, the scheme. Uh, to qualify, uh, the young farmer must be head of holding, must be the boss. 
uh, no more than 40 years of age in that first year of application to the basic payment scheme. And it operates as a top-up payment. Now, the maximum scale size of that top-up payment is 84 euros per hectare. But that's, we have to live within the 2% budget. So if the 2% budget is, if we reach that ceiling, then that payment per hectare will be scaled back. Maximum of 90 hectares uh, in any one claim, up to a maximum of five years from the point at which uh, the young farmer beca first became head of holding. And of course, uh, a level, three, uh, level two qualification in agriculture. Uh, is there an eligibility requirement for uh, this measure? Uh, and we have a large number of uh, individuals currently going through uh, a programme organised by CAFRI uh, at this point in time. And finally then, uh, for those who have never held single farm payment entitlements, and there are some farmers out there who may have started a business since 2005, were never allocated uh, entitlements, they can be brought into the new regime. They will be brought into the new regime uh, as long as they can show that they were involved in production activity uh, on the 15th of May 2013. And for many farmers, uh, we will already have those records if they were involved in uh, cattle or sheep production. We, we can drive that information off the AFIS system. And finally, uh, the regional reserve, just to complete the, the package. So this will be available to deal with uh, young farmers and new entrants, uh, available in 2015, but also available in subsequent years. Uh, so this is uh, something that's, uh, that will continue uh, beyond 2015 and will also be used to deal with cases of exceptional circumstances in, in that first year. Again, for new farmers, young entrants, a requirement for a level two qualification. And in terms of the, the size of the budget that will be set aside uh, for the regional reserve, up to 3% initially, but if we need more to deal with uh, claims from new, young farmers, new entrants, then we have to provide for that, which means scaling back the available budget uh, for the basic payment scheme. So we have to live within a single budget uh, and we're limited to that. So that's the, the framework uh, that we will be operating. I say it's probably as simple a framework as we could have uh, devised, um, obviously more complicated than what we're leaving behind in terms of a single farm payment, but that's what, uh, we're, how we're moving forward. In terms of uh, potential impact on the production, beef production sector, um, this is a bit of analysis looking at the 2013 claims database matched in within farm types identified from the 2012 census. So we have uh, the main cattle ca categories in the SDA, the DA and Lowland. This shows the, the impact of moving towards a flat rate regime over a seven year convergence period. So if you're looking at cattle in the SDA, you're talking about right, around about a 1% per annum reduction over that seven year period. If you're looking at uh, mixed uh, SDA holdings, round about 2.5% uh, per annum reduction in level of support, or sorry, increase in level of support. Then you get down into the cattle and sheep in the DA and the lowland, quite significant reduction uh, in the level of uh, support there. Uh, in the DA, it's about 3.5% per annum over those uh, seven years and about 4% per annum uh, for the lowland. So this is the, the aggregate picture uh, for these, these farm types over that period of full convergence, so seven years uh, to get to that scale of uh, change. Obviously, it's one thing talking about how much uh, direct support is going into a business. It's a different thing then whenever you actually look at the impact of that on the bottom line, on income. And we all know that uh, particularly in the beef sector, there's a very heavy reliance on support. Uh, and so some of the changes we're going to see could have significant impact on that bottom line. The impact will depend, of course, on how uh, well the businesses are doing uh, in more general terms, uh, uh, in terms of the revenues coming from the market. And this is just showing the impact on, on two different uh, years. 2011-12, this is taking data from the, uh, the farm business survey. Uh, that particular year was a reasonable year for incomes. The following year, a uh, much more challenging position. Looking at the, the impact, how we assessed this was effectively taking the accounts from these farms, stripping out the single farm payment that they're currently receiving, and substituting back in what they would receive after full convergence towards flat rate to try and judge the scale of the potential impact. 
If you're looking at, uh, in this particular year, you can see come some quite sizable uh, changes, uh, particularly in the DA uh, and Lowland situation, um, 30 to 40 percent uh, reduction uh, in net farm income, and that's in a, a reasonable year. Obviously, if you have a particularly challenging year, then the percentage impact uh, is greater, uh, simple mathematics. But um, remember, in many ways, this shows uh, the most extreme uh, impact. This is effectively compressing seven years' worth of adjustment into one. Businesses will undoubtedly adjust and what they're doing. Uh, they will adapt to the new uh, regime. Uh, and so it's not really realistic to expect to see those types of reduction. Uh, and businesses will take the opportunity to adjust what they're doing to reflect the new circumstances uh, and to meet that challenge. And of course, the other thing, I mean, I've, I've given you effectively aggregate figures and uh, average figures. There is considerable variation um, around all of this. Even if you take uh, cattle and sheep in the DEA, cattle and sheep in, in the lowland, which overall we'll be seeing an overall significant reduction over the seven years. Even here, there are significant numbers of winners, people who will actually end up with more support, even though the overall position is a net reduction. So it very much depends on the individual circumstances uh, being faced uh, on the farm. Um, and of course, it will also depend on the decisions that are taken in 2015. Uh, by individual farmers because, as I mentioned right at the start, they have an opportunity in 2015 to amend decisions that they took back in 2005 in terms of the extent to which they stack their entitlements. This shows the average uh, value of single farm payment held by each of these uh, categories of uh, cattle holdings. Those averages um, reflect decisions that were taken in 2005 around stacking uh, of entitlement. In 2015, producers will have the opportunity to reverse uh, some of those decisions, and the average, uh, those averages will certainly fall in 2015 as people spread uh, their entitlement pot across bigger areas uh, of land, reduce their starting position uh, and therefore uh, mitigate the impact on their business uh, as we move towards flat rate, because the flat rate payment is always a fixed end point. So what you've seen uh, to date really, I suppose, or in, in the previous slides, re reflects worst case scenario, and businesses will take uh, steps to mitigate uh, that impact. Now, in terms of the spreading of entitlement across a uh, larger land area, that will be facilitated by non-farming landowners exiting the system. If we look at uh, the position in 2013, in 2013, about 132,000 entitlements were held by individuals claiming the basic 78 euros per hectare. So these are non-farming landowners who entered the system in 2005. About 9,500 claimants in 2013, claiming about 9 million uh, euros. If they were to remain in the system into full convergence, they would have uh, be achieving 43 million. If those individuals uh, leave the system, then obviously this sum of money is effectively available for redistribution uh, towards active farmers. And there's a second category here, uh, individuals who are claiming 2013 who we couldn't actually match, match to a census record. Probably a significant number of those are people who uh, are claiming more than the 78 euros per hectare, probably farmers who have retired since 2005. So again, probably a significant proportion of those uh, will, are effectively non-farming landowners. Currently, uh, in 2013, holding about 26 million uh, euros worth of entitlement. If that went to flat rate, would up to 33. So between those two categories, you probably have 50 or 60 million pounds worth uh, uh, at a flat rate uh, to, to redistribute towards active farmers. That process is already starting. 
I said in 2013, we had 133,000 uh, entitlements in the hands of 9,500 claimants. 2014, that is down to about 78,000. So already there's been a significant step uh, towards non-farming landowners exiting the system. And hopefully uh, we'll have a further significant step uh, in, in 2015. So this is where uh, farmers, active farmers then have the opportunity to rebase uh, their uh, support uh, platform and, and to spread their, their entitlement uh, pot across a bigger area of land and mitigate the impact uh, on, on their business. Okay, so that's uh, sort of a, a quick trot through. Um, just want to finish off by talking, you know, while it's important to talk about cap reform, it is important to the industry, it needs to be put in a proper context, particularly whenever you're looking at the longer term. Always need to remember, we're now talking about a decoupled support regime. It's been decoupled since 2005. It's not there to support production. It's not there to enhance productivity. It will not improve the competitive or the, the efficiency of your business. It, it will not move your business to a better place. It's an income support. Fundamentally, that's what it is. And the value of that income support has been falling in real terms. By 2020, we will have had 20 years basically at the same level of support within Northern Ireland, have 20 years of inflation. We've, that has been masked to a degree uh, by, uh, in the earlier years, uh, positive exchange rate movements. Those exchange rate movements are moving in the opposite direction. So you have to place CAP uh, in a proper context. At the end of the day, CAP Pillar 1 support does not really offer a far, firm foundation in which to build a sustainable uh, sector. You can't build an industry on subsidy. And you have to uh, think back to the fundamentals you've heard this morning you think around improving efficiency, uh, serving the market, improving your productivity. Those are the things that you can drive forward uh, and actually try to build sustainability uh, within the sector. You cannot build sustainability by relying on, on a subsidy regime. Um, it will help support what's there, but it doesn't really move the industry forward. And so innovation, research, technology transfer, those are the things that will make a difference in the long term. Thank you.